Good afternoon and welcome to the Carnegie Endowment. Can people please take their seats or find a place to stand, given the fact that there seems to be very few seats left? Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we are very pleased to be hosting this event on democratization in the Arab world, uh, together with the RAND Corporation. Uh, the issue of democratization in the Arab world has consumed a lot of attention in Washington and elsewhere in the last year. Uh, we have been working on the issue uh, extensively here and through our Beirut office. Uh, RAND went one better, and they actually published a, a, a full-length study on it, this book on democratization in the Arab world, which I understand this is one of the first printed copies to, uh, to, uh, to show up, and it will be available on the RAND website. Uh, so uh, given the fact that we have a lot of people who will want to ask questions and three speakers, I'm not going to spend time on the introduction. Uh, I think we all know why the issue is so important at the present time. Let me just introduce briefly the, th the uh, uh, three speakers. Uh, to my left is Laurel Miller, who is a senior policy analyst at the RAND Corporation and the lead author of Democratization in the Arab World. Uh, to her left is Jeffrey Martini, uh, who is a Middle East specialist at the RAND Corporation. I'm not going to give you their background because uh, because you all have the, uh, the bios in front of you. And to my right is Tom Carruthers, uh, who has essentially has been the pioneer of studies on democratization, uh, first in Eastern Europe and then wherever democratization was taking place here at Carnegie. So without further ado, I think Laurel and Jeffrey are going to alternate somewhat in the presentation of the study and then Tom will comment on it. Thank you. Uh, I'll first say just a few words about the nature of the book, which is available as of today on the RAND website. And then Jeff and I will highlight some of the main conclusions from our work. So the book uh, aimed to answer three principal questions. The first one is, what are the challenges to democratization that are facing Egypt, Tunisia, <coughs> and other countries in the Arab world that are undergoing political transitions? The second question is, how have other countries around the world in the past overcome or failed to overcome similar challenges? And the third question is, how can governments and institutions in the international community help these countries that are undergoing political change uh, to democratize and to strengthen fledgling democracies and overcome the challenges that we identify. So to answer those questions, our study brings together an analysis of the political changes that are unfolding in the Arab world uh, and a detailed examination of past experiences with democratization over nearly four decades in every other part of the world, including Europe, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. I'm going to highlight a few of our higher level conclusions from the study, and then Jeff and I will focus in a bit more depth on two issues that are of uh, particular relevance to current events in the Arab world, one of those is the rebalancing of civilian and military power in the aftermath of regime change. And the other is the inclusion of Islamist parties in politics. One of the important broad lessons from our study is that if you take a long look backward as we do at democratization experiences, that shows the importance of taking the long view forward in assessing the prospects for democracy to take root in the Arab world. So to be more specific about what I mean, many successful transitions in the past have been quite tumultuous, particularly in their early periods. And even though in retrospect uh, it may seem inevitable that some of these countries became consolidated democracies, it didn't seem like a sure bet at the time in many instances. <clears throat> 
Just to give a couple of examples, uh, Portugal had many conditions that would seem to be favorable for democratization, but it had six transitional governments within its first 27 months after the regime change. It had a transitional military government that was riven by ideological differences, experienced massive purges, and other sorts of disruptions. Uh, Romania also um, had the benefit of being in Europe, but on the other hand, it had a prolonged and chaotic transition, particularly in the early years. And there are many other examples as well. Now, many countries have also faced uh, military coups and mutinies during the early years of political change. Uh, In general, these have not led to reversions to authoritarianism or the return of military government, uh, but they do show how tumultuous a transition period can be. And just from the countries that we focus some specific attention on in our study, uh, examples include Greece and Spain, the Philippines, Argentina, Peru, all experienced multiple attempted coups or mutinies uh, for several years after their regime changes. Now, consolidation of democracy requires systemic change, not just a removal of autocratic leaders from the top. And this takes a long period of time. So again, this points to the importance of taking the long view in assessing the prospects for democracy. Now, another important lesson from our study is that there are no insurmountable obstacles to democratization in the Arab world, even though there are, of course, considerable challenges, uh, and even though authoritarianism does remain resilient in the region. Democracy has spread to extremely varied social and cultural terrain around the world, including to places that had been thought unsuited to democracy. So, for example, theorists had theories to explain why there was a lack of democratization in Latin America and in Asia before uh, there were waves of democratization experiences in those parts of the world, just as there are theories to explain why the Middle East and North Africa has been the exception from the global trend toward uh, ever greater numbers of democracies. Scholars who have studied democratization have tried to pinpoint what the particular factors are that tend to contribute to successful democratization or undermine democratization processes, but they really haven't uh, found any clear-cut answers. Uh, Even to the extent that some scholars who have conducted statistical analyses of large numbers of countries and their democratization experiences, uh, even to the extent that they have identified some statistically significant factors that seem to contribute to or upturns or downturns in levels of democracy, these do not by themselves explain the phenomenon. Uh, They do not determine the outcomes of political changes, uh, and there are plenty exceptions to every uh, purported factor that has been identified. So in other words, there is a lot of room for political decisions, uh, policy choices, and the, the actions taken by individual leaders to be more consequential in terms of the outcomes of political transitions uh, than any kind of structural factors like historical, social, cultural, or economic factors. Now, some of the emerging challenges that uh, we've seen in the Arab world in the wake of the Arab Spring, um, and that have led to what we think are some premature declarations of the failure of the Arab Spring are surely going to make for a rocky road ahead for many of these countries. But looking back at past transitions, these sorts of challenges have not derailed uh, many democratization experiences or caused reversions to authoritarianism. So we think it's important to distinguish between political problems, political challenges, and the actual risk of reversion to authoritarianism or failure of a democratic transition. So Egypt, for instance, um, currently faces some rather serious economic problems and high expectations of improvement of living standards and new economic opportunities, and 
these sorts of uh, economic challenges have been thought to be uh, a factor that risks the failure of a democratic transition. But in fact, failures to improve living standards to meet those high expectations have not caused reversals in the past. And indeed, some countries, for example, Argentina, Mongolia, and some others, have suffered rather severe post-regime change economic deterioration, and yet democratization has proceeded in those countries. Sectarian, ethnic, and other sorts of social divisions um, have raised concerns about the prospects for democracy in some Arab countries. Uh, but these sorts of uh, difficulties have not been a bar to democratization elsewhere. And to give one example, Indonesia is an extremely diverse country, uh, one whose circumstances would in many ways not seem favorable for democratization, and yet uh, democracy has been established there. Inexperience with uh, democratic practices is, a, is another factor that has raised some concerns, particularly in Libya, for example. Uh, and this does suggest the need for civic education, uh, the need for institutional reform to build up democratic practices and procedures. But experience with political participation and with political pluralism has not been a prerequisite for successful democratization elsewhere. Now, we are not predicting that democratization in the Arab countries in transition is necessarily going to succeed because there certainly is plenty of room for missteps along the way. But what we are saying is that based on experiences in the past around the world, uh, much of the current pessimism uh, about uh, the prospects for the Arab Spring to lead to uh, real democracy in the region, we think is, uh, is unwarranted pe pessimism. Now, Jeff is going to talk a bit about the two particular challenges that I mentioned. We'll have a little back and forth, and I'll reflect on some of the lessons from the cases that we looked at that relate to those challenges. Okay. So now that Laurel has presented some of the broader conclusions or broader findings of the study, again, I'm going to drill down into a couple of issues that we judge to be particularly consequential in terms of the transition in Egypt. And the idea is to be illustrative, to focus on one case here, Egypt, and a couple of issues, the need for civil military rebalancing and inclusion of Islamist parties in formal politics, um, to get an idea for the challenges that are present in Egypt and also what history can tell us about how those challenges have been navigated in the past. For, so for those of you Egypt watchers out there, and I'm sure there are many of you, Marina is certainly one of them, it won't come as a surprise that we flag civil-military relations as particularly consequential for the prospects of democratization in Egypt. And that's because if you look at its modern history, the six intervening decades between the 1952 Free Officers Revolution and what's called the January 25th Revolution of 2011, you'll see that the military was really the center of gravity of the regime, at times dominating politics. After the 1967 war, perhaps receding some, but still hovering over politics. And so the most obvious manifestation of that, of course, was through the executive. In those about six decades, you had four presidents, not coincidentally all drawn from the officer corps, Mohammed Naguib, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Anwar Sadat, Hosni Mubarak. You had the operation of a parallel economy and judicial system, and you had the skirting of parliamentary oversight by the generals electing their own to the parliament and then staffing the Defense and National Security Committee that had nominal parliamentary oversight. So this is certainly going to be a key challenge going forward in Egypt, and we've already seen it be a point of being contested between the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces on the one hand and uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and some of the secular political forces on the other. We saw this, for example, in the floating of super constitutional principles last year. We saw this more recently in the issuing of a so-called constitutional supplemental, which was designed to protect uh, the military's prerogatives and privileges. And on the other hand, we see this in Mohamed Morsi issuing executive decrees, which are designed to wrest back some of that authority. So looking forward, we um, identify a number of different dimensions or planes in which we think civil-military relations will be fought out in Egypt or will hopefully be negotiated in Egypt. Um, and that first plane or dimension has to do with uh, 
budget and economic issues. So some of the big questions, for example, are how secret will the military's budget will, will it be? Will it appear as a single number? Or will parliamentarians be able to review the details of that budget? How about the tax advantages that are enjoined uh, that are enjoyed by the military, particularly with regards to its agricultural production or the fact that it use, is conscript labor, giving it a huge economic advantage. Um, in addition to budget and economic issues, you've got power of appointment. Who will ultimately have the power to appoint the Minister of Defense and the Minister of Military Production? Who will be in charge of internal promotion within the military? And then in addition to that, you've got this third dimension, which is the legal status of the military. What about the military tribunals? Will the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, enjoy some legal immunity or an element of it from uh, the period in which it held the executive, 16 months? And then finally, who will define national security policy? If we look back at the historical model in Egypt, of course, in the United States, the uniforms the military implements does not make national security policy. In Egypt, you cannot overstate that they made national security policy. So the question will be, will the military have a veto over questions of war and peace? Uh, will they have the ability to conclude arms agreements absent parliamentary <laughs> approval? Now, that's pretty down in the weeds, but we want to give you a flavor for the detail we present in the book. And now Laurel's going to jump back in and say, what can we learn from some of the historical cases about how these challenges have been navigated? So we found in our study that in circumstances where the military retains the capability and also the potential incentives to thwart democratization, that negotiation has been needed in order to ease them out of their political role. And this has often been affected in a very gradual way. Uh, now, this sort of negotiation means offering concessions to the military on exactly the same kinds of issues that Jeff mentioned are on the table in Egypt are the same kinds of issues that have come up in past cases. Uh, now, uh, you know, hopefully it will be possible in Egypt, as it has been elsewhere, to offer concessions that do not undermine democracy over the long term. Um, but it is true that these sorts of concessions do delay the full completion of a democratic transition, the full consolidation of democracy. Uh, often these sorts of concessions have been written into constitutions, and so that is likely to be one of the key battlegrounds in the constitution-making process ahead in Egypt. Um, to be clear, we're not saying these sorts of concessions are desirable, and certainly not desirable in terms of the development of democracy and, uh, and the interests of those who uh, want a fully representative government with full accountability. But we are observing that these sorts of concessions have been needed in some past transitions in the kind of circumstances I described where the military does still retain the, the capability and interest if its interests are not protected to thwart democratization. Sometimes it's taken a rather long time to work these sorts of special prerogatives out of the political system. Uh, in Portugal, it was eight years before the special prerogatives written into the Constitution were removed. In Chile, it was 25 years. Uh, in Turkey, the process of fully transitioning to civilian control is in some respects still underway three decades after the last handover to civilian rule. Uh, where militaries are, are weaker um, or discredited, uh, for example, in Argentina, where the military was discredited by its loss in the Falklands War, it has uh, not been as seen as quite as necessary to have the same extent of special prerogatives written into, uh, into the political system for the time being. Um, now, in the meantime, uh, in, in a circumstance where those kinds of concessions are made, external supporters of democratization and in the international community can try to be helpful by supporting the development of civilian capabilities to exercise oversight. So once these kinds of special privileges are removed, the civilian <clears throat> parliaments, for example, are able to fully exercise their oversight authority. So the second issue we want to delve into in more detail is uh, the process of Islamist inclusion. Again, we'll play this out in the context of Egypt, but it applies more broadly. 
Um, and I'm going to do this a little more briefly than I did for civil military relations because I want to get back to Marina and Tom and, and your questions. Uh, but our bottom line in terms of the inclusion of Islamists in formal politics, and of course, this isn't a process that started with the revolution in Egypt or with the Arab Spring. You had the Muslim Brotherhood participating as independents in parliamentary elections or in electoral alliances in Egypt for some time. You've got justice and development in Morocco, the Islamic Action Front in Jordan. But things have changed. So, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood now has a sanctioned political party, the Freedom and Justice Party. You have different Islamist groups to include Salafi groups participating in, in Egypt, and you will have them participating in the future in Tunisia. Several uh, groups have now uh, have sanctioned political parties. And our bottom line is we see this as a net positive for democratization. Why? There's a number of advantages. Uh, the inclusion of Islamists or taking away some of the red lines or constraints or the asterisks that's next to the Islamist parties um, provides a greater chance to legitimate governing institutions. So when you're talking about a current, an ideological current, that is as popular as it is in many of these societies, excluding them from the political process or treating them with an asterisk after their name, uh, it, it removes a source of legitimacy from governing institutions. The second point is it moves Islamists from kind of knee-jerk opposition to being part of governing coalitions and proposing solutions. And that's an important step ultimately towards accountability where instead of Islamists accruing votes because in some places they're seen as the principled opposition or they're the receiver of the protest vote, instead it poses in the future the possibility they will be judged on governing in their particular programs. Now, of course, there's some risks or some downsides involved. One is uh, some of these groups, their commitment to minority rights is an open question. I tend to be one of those that are that is convinced uh, by the Brotherhood's talk in Egypt, for example, that they have moderated on, on a number of different issues, embraced multi-party politics, revised their position on minority rights, but it's still problematic for them. The Brotherhood's official position, as articulated by their general guide, uh, Mohamed Badia, is that while they would not oppose if the people chose a woman or a copt, to be president of Egypt, they still believe a Muslim male is uniquely qualified to be commander in chief. Uh, I find that troubling. Um, and there's another, there's other, uh, you know, risks or issues associated with Islamist inclusion. One is we review studies that show that in so-called breakthrough elections, after there's been a hiatus in elections, or previously prohibited groups are allowed to participate. Islamists often do well in those first elections. And these first elections in the Arab world are particularly consequential because they're often for constituent assemblies that will go on to draft permanent constitutions. Now, our study of past experience has shown that inclusive approaches to reshaping the political sphere after a regime change have tended to help stabilize the transition process, even where opening up the political playing field seemed rather risky or was quite controversial at the time. Uh, so, for example, in Indonesia, the decision to allow Islamist parties to participate uh, after Suharto's ouster. Uh, in other countries, other contexts like Greece and Spain, the decisions to allow the communist parties to participate and to legalize them during their uh, transition periods were quite controversial, but seen as very um, helpful to consolidating democracy. We've seen no evidence in our study that inclusion of Islamist parties is any sort of threat to a democratization process. Now, it's true that their commitment to rotation of power has not been tested, as some have pointed out, uh, but it's just as true in any new democracy that the commitment of new parties participating uh, for the first time, or at least participating freely for the first time, uh, have not had their commitments uh, tested, secular parties I'm, I'm speaking of. And there are certainly examples of secular parties uh, which once in power have uh, undermined democratization. Um, <clears throat> now, we think it's important to distinguish between the growth of identity-based politics uh, in a new democracy, which is a phenomenon we've seen in a number of places, from any concerns about 
the, about potential efforts to dismantle electoral politics once, uh, once parties have succeeded. Overall, I would say that uh, in terms of the prospects for democratization over the long term, it's much more important what sort of rules of the political game are established in the transition period than it is who wins or loses the initial elections. And I think we'll um, leave it at there and turn okay. it over to Tom for comments. Thank you very much. When the Arab uprisings started occurring a little more than a year and a half ago, there was a tremendous rush here in Washington, but in other Western capitals, to draw analogies between these uprisings and the experience of transitions and collapse of authoritarian rule in, in other countries. This was natural. We were surprised by these events. <clears throat> they were almost entirely unpredicted. And they were occurring in a region that had never really experienced such change, and we needed to make sense of them. And when you're disoriented and in a dark room, stumbling about objects you can't really fathom. Uh, analogies are the natural crutch that you look for. And I don't mean crutch in, a, in really a necessarily a negative sense, because I think it's natural. Human beings need to understand events in relation to each other. What was surprising to me and somewhat disturbing was how frequently the policy community settled on analogies to Central and Eastern Europe. I think the images of the crowds in Cairo and in Tunis reminded people of crowds in Prague and Warsaw and other places in Central and Eastern Europe. And somehow analogies were drawn between, if you will, the mode of transition, lots of crowds in the central square, what looked like it was the mode of transition, without looking at the underlying nature of the governments that were maybe on their way out or the power structures, what really was the nature of the opposition movements, what was the nature of the societies underneath uh, these things, and so forth. And when you looked at those things, you realized fairly quickly that the analogies to Central and Eastern Europe were seriously misplaced. And that in fact, as I've argued <clears throat> off and on again over the last year, if you were doing a thought experiment, you probably couldn't design a more different regional comparison between Central and Eastern Europe in 1989 and the Arab world in 2011. Yet that was the analogy that people gravitated toward. That's faded pretty quickly. <clears throat> These days, Cairo doesn't look a lot like Warsaw. Uh, Sana'a in Yemen doesn't look a lot like Prague. Uh, and I doubt if Damascus is going to look much like Budapest. Uh, and so people have moved away from those analogies. And yet I think the general idea of learning from experience is a good one. And I'm glad that Rand and, and, and Laurel and Jeffrey have taken up this task of looking much more broadly at the transitional experience. And I congratulate them for taking a much wider perspective and trying to reach both wider and deeper into the really remarkable range of transitional experiences over the last 40 years. And I think this study is, is foundational in that sense that no one else has attempted to do that. Now, they looked at both structural factors and policy outcomes. In other words, whether or not a country has oil, a structural factor, or policy choices rather than outcomes, and whether or not a country decides to have elections before or after it writes a constitution, for example. Now, I'm particularly glad that you guys looked at structural factors because this has been greatly, I'd say, underemphasized in analyses in Washington of processes of democratization around the world. In part, there's been a kind of political correctness in the U.S. policy community about structural factors. It's kind of like a somehow an American's mind, like a bunch of kids in the classroom, and you're not allowed to ask anything about their genetic makeup or maybe their families or anything. You're just supposed to treat them all as equal students, which is true. It's what one should do in a classroom. But if one's trying to understand how countries are going to change politically over time, not looking seriously at the structural conditions at any particular juncture is, is a mistake. And I think that uh, it was also a tendency not to look at structure. There was also a tendency not to look at structural conditions because people felt we don't necessarily know enough. The experience is so confusing. You have countries like Mongolia that don't seem to have any of the structural preconditions for democracy that have done pretty well, and countries that had many that didn't do so well. So there was a feeling of maybe it's just all too confusing. But I actually I don't think it is. <clears throat> so confusing, and I think there is some wisdom. And, and I think that the structural factors that they've pinpointed in this study or emphasized are the right ones, and those are uh, 
you look at a country's experience with pluralism over time. <clears throat> you look at a country's economic level, often the concentration of economic resources as well as the economic level, levels of inequality and things like that. You look at the degree of social and political cohesion of, of the state and really of the society in terms of potential fragmentation of the society. You look at the neighborhood, whether the neighborhood is helpful or not to democratization. You look at the role of outside actors. Now, it's true, as they say in the book, and they, and they were just saying here, that no one of these factors is really determinative. And you can, have, you can miss out on some, or potentially even all of them, and still manage to democratize. But they are actually, they do weigh heavily. And they do point you towards much greater likelihood and much less likelihood of successful democratization in different societies. And when you look at the Arab world, and here I, I draw a little bit of a distinction between my view and the view of the study, I'm a little less optimistic. Uh, <clears throat> the picture doesn't look so good. In most countries, and I'm not just focused on Egypt and Tunisia here, because these are leading edge cases, but the Arab world also contains Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Algeria and lots of other cases. When you look at the Arab world overall, you see very little experience with pluralism going back a very long way. You see economic patterns that are troubling. You have a very high degree of concentration of resources in some countries because of natural resources. And in those countries that don't have oil, they have very high levels of poverty and high levels of inequality, high levels of illiteracy, and so forth. In terms of sociopolitical cohesion, it varies a lot. You have some places that are really in serious trouble in that regard or have a, a pattern of, of problems like Yemen. Others, like Egypt, are much better in that regard. But you have some real reasons for, for doubt and concern in a number of countries. The neighborhood effect is serious. <clears throat> um, and it's hard to sort of say that it's any one thing. But you know there is the Gulf <clears throat> there, which has an interest in a certain kind of political outcome in a number of countries and is taking steps in various countries to influence the politics of its neighbors. And for the most part, although Syria may be an exception, it's not a pro-democratic direction. And the role of outside actors, although the United States and Europe now side with democracy, at least formally, in some countries in the Arab world, they're not really siding with democracy. They still have strong interests in stability, and US and European policy is quite divided. So when you take those five things together, I'd say we see tough times ahead in the Arab world for the successful consolidation of democracy. And what's important to remember that these factors are more about the likely success over time, not whether or not an authoritarian regime can collapse. And people often mistake these two things. So authoritarian regimes can collapse in the most you know, unfelicitous <coughs> conditions for democratization. The North Korean regime may collapse <coughs> in the next five or 10 years. It doesn't mean North Korea will be well positioned then to consolidate democracy. And uh, there's, <coughs> it's true that one can find countries that are exceptions for each of those things. And you mentioned various places. But we also have to look at the fact that there are two large regions in the world that have tried to democratize in the last 20 years, and they're not doing very well. One is the former Soviet Union, which despite the collapse of the Soviet Union and despite an initial push towards democracy, a significant amount of Western aid, the former Soviet Union is largely an anti-democratic zone or a political wasteland in terms of democratic progress. And that's a sto you know, stony and cold fact about the experience of democratization. Despite you know, fairly high levels of education in various countries, fair amount of social cohesion in some countries, and so forth. Secondly, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a very mixed picture out of the 45 to 50 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some, you know, less than a third, are doing pretty well. A third are doing terribly, and a third are in a gray area in between. But overall, the very wide <clears throat> movement towards democracy in sub-Saharan Africa of the first half of the 1990s has not been fulfilled with a broad pattern of democratization. In cases like Mali, which were in the camp up until six months ago, the one-third that were doing fairly well are still very fragile. And so I think we have to be very careful, and I appreciate <clears throat> the approach of trying to accent the positive and trying not to condemn the world to some, the Arab world to some kind of special Arab exceptionalism. But we do have to look at the fact that there are other regions that aren't doing very well, largely because of these structural characteristics, which the Arab world shares to a fairly high degree. So as I wrote way back in February or March last year, I think that 
we're likely to see in the Arab world a fairly mixed picture over the next 10, 20, or 30 years, somewhat similar to the rest of the African continent, which shares many of these structural <coughs> characteristics. Now, regarding policy choices, that's about structural conditions. What about policy choices? The book presents a, a kind of a blizzard of lessons because they've done a lot of hard work and looked at a lot of cases, um, ranging from Argentina to Greece to Indonesia to Mongolia and so forth. Um, you guys have been busy, uh, and uh, I appreciate that. On the other hand, I found the lessons a mix. Some of them I found interesting. Some, and I don't mean to sound too harsh, I found a little bit bland, and I'll say what I mean by that. In one or two, at least, I, I thought are worth discussing or questioning. Interesting, for example, I thought very interesting is that you're finding that how first elections go after authoritarian collapse isn't all that consequential in the long run. That's interesting, and it's important to think about because Washington tends to obsess over first elections and think that they're determined. That's an example of a lesson that I think is immediate policy relevance and, and immediate kind of import. Also interesting is, as you mentioned today, is that the inclusion of formerly banned groups rarely or never presents a problem for democratization. That's a very significant lesson, which you know merits bearing in mind and thinking about. Third, that generally the backing away of militaries from their stranglehold on power has been done through conciliatory approaches rather than confrontational ones. That's significant too. Now, <clears throat> that's the interesting. In the category of the bland, um, <clears throat> I found, uh, <clears throat> quote, Constitution making can be used to foster successful democratization by consolidating consensus. That's probably true. Uh, that didn't happen in Iraq. Uh, constitution making was not used to foster successful democratization. So that sometimes lessons end up sounding like a statement of the obvious because behind it is differential experience and maybe the lesson could be phrased a different way that constitution making needs to have certain characteristics, otherwise it won't play this role. I know that's implied, but I didn't find it there. Or similarly, quote, a lack of consensus on the nature of the state can present an obstacle to democratization. Yes, it can, uh, and it will. Um, <clears throat> and so sometimes, but that's inevitable one does a, a wide reach uh, for lessons that some come out in this character, but behind them is, I think, more knowledge and, and more insight. What was questionable to me is one that I think it's worth pausing over and we could talk about is you say economic problems are not determinative of the course of democratization. I immediately think of the case of Russia. Russia's financial crisis of the late 1990s and the feeling by the Russian people that they had been failed economically uh, by the experience of the 1990s paved the way for Putin's reconsolidation and centralization of power over the last decade. It was the Russian experience with the failure of the economic <clears throat> model of the 1990s that really undermined Russian democratization. And so even when, you know, there may be lots of cases on the other side, but you've got a big important case there that's quite sobering, that, you know, it's not hard to think that Egypt might experience something like that if it really falls apart economically over the next five years. Um, they may well vote back into power, somebody who reconsolidates power in a sort of military style with the military as their backer. And it's just not hard to imagine that scenario, at least for me. So I think we've got to be careful. You, you do caution in the book and say, you know, no lesson should be re applied reflexively, and I like the spirit of that, but sometimes these lessons, I think, are worth taking a second look at. That leads me to just two final uh, <clears throat> reflections. One is about just this, the use of lessons. It's something people in the policy community want to do, and why is it so hard? I'm trying to highlight a few of the difficulties, and I think we tend to think it's hard because there's so many cases and they seem to point in so many directions, and so it's hard to find common patterns. That's true, but that isn't what I think is really hard about lessons. What's hard about lessons, <clears throat> in my view, and what is really difficult, is that the fine-grained realities in any specific context are so particular to that country that what looks like an apparent lesson will be undermined by those realities. And general statements or semi-general statements about certain sociopolitical processes cannot help but mask those particularities. So if we say, for example, that we say something about the nature of how military regimes undo, are undone over time and taken away from power, it's going to depend a lot on the nature of the military. <clears throat> you know, there's the Chilean military and the Egyptian military. 
they're two fundamentally different institutions. The Chilean military was trained by Prussians in the early 20th century. It came into power in the early 1970s at a very particular ideological conjuncture which gave it its sort of legitimacy as occupying power and when that legitimacy faded by the mid-1980s, it left power. The Egyptian military was not trained by the Prussians in the early 20th century. It had different origins. It's a different kind of social organization. Its role in Egyptian politics over the last 50 years has been quite different from the Chilean role. It didn't come in at a particular juncture due to something that then faded and then they left power 15 years later and so forth. And so any lesson we have drawn from the Chilean military or the Brazilian military or others even though it's called the military, we have to look and say, will the Egyptian military behave like these? I know you guys know that, but we have to be careful, all of us, when we extract general lessons and say, this approach to a military will be best or will be good. Similarly with Islamist parties. I take very much, and I, I like the spirit of the point you make about Islamist inclusion, and I think the examples of Turkey and Indonesia are quite pertinent, but the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is not like the AKP in Turkey. It's a different kind of part. It's a different organization. The AKP does not have the social roots of the Muslim Brotherhood in the same way. It's not actually an Islamist organization at all in the same way of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the role of Islam in Turkey is quite different than that in Egypt in terms of its relation to the society overall and the identity of the country and so forth. And Indonesian Islamist parties, although they're Islamist parties, aren't very much like the Muslim Brotherhood in terms of, again, their, their relation to Indonesian identity, sort of the overall place of Islam and Indonesian life and so forth. And so therefore, we can try to say, gee, I think having seen Islamist parties in Indonesia and Turkey act this way, we think you know, this will be true. But actually, we don't know. Uh, and so, Lessons are hard, <clears throat> and this is where policymakers stumble, is they're stumbling in the dark, looking for, for handrails, and they latch on to fairly generalized ideas about militaries and Islamist parties and other things that sound like recipes. And the spirit of this book is don't take simple recipes, but I just want to push that even a step farther and say we've got to really, even the thoughtful lessons that come out have to be scrutinized fully before we can be really confident about their application. For me, it leaves me both to look at the structural and the policy, um, structural factors, policy choices that I see in the Arab world, it leaves me in a somewhat more pessimistic point of view than you guys, but I like the spirit of what you're doing, but I think maybe because I've done a fair amount of work in the former Soviet Union and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and other regions that are really struggling 20 or 25 years after initial transitions, I think we're in for a long and difficult road. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll open it up uh, for questions. Please identify yourself. And I'll add the footnote that I reserve the, uh, uh, the right to intervene in the discussion at times because having worked on these issues intensely for the past 18 months, I, don't, <laughs> I think the temptation is going to be very, uh, very strong. I'll take uh, three questions at a time and please identify yourself. Let's start over there. Thank you very much for this. My name is Nancy O'Kale, and I'm from Freedom House. Um, I just want to, I'm a bit skeptical about the, the prospect of offering concessions for the military in a way that can be done without avoiding a, a form of cohabitation that would only perpetuate the status quo. Because, I mean, in, in my view, what is happening now in Egypt is not really a breakaway from the past. But it's more taking everything that happened before, but in a bigger scale and uh, less timid than it was before. And if we just look at the main political forces now in Egypt, I mean, we have the military, we have the Islamists, and we have the business elite, mo mostly the liberals. And the problem is that they are not highly interdependent on each other. So the idea that they can just live happily together uh, is, is possible, especially with the concession, but that would only be at the expense of the marginalized groups I mean, who have no voice and have no opportunity to uh, voice their, uh, their opposition and, and their demand. Um, 
the, the business elite at the time of Mubarak uh, were only given economic privileges and not non-economic privileges that tie them to the regime. At the same time, the military, uh, they Please have their own- Please keep it short. Okay, well the, well the idea is that they, they can just uh, coexist together without coming against uh, each other's privileges, which is going to perpetuate the status quo. Offering concession, concession is going to exaggerate this okay. problem. So what, where, where can we find a breakaway from this situation? Thank you. Okay. Other questions at this point? Yes. Thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, my name is Karen Kaya, and I work for the Army. Um, so I know for a study like this, you had to be selective in what you chose as far as your defining democracy. Uh, so wondering what factors you focused on, like free and fair elections, you know, political pluralism, freedom, freedom of speech, religion, which factors did you focus on? Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Magnus Parra, political science student. Uh, what is your opinion on women's rights in the new constitutions? If they should be part of the constitution in order to establish a democracy, uh, or if this should be weighted with, seeing as it's still very political in the region? Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, I think I'll, I'll quickly answer the, the second question about defining democracy. Uh, this is actually a very um, fraught aspect of the democratization literature. How do you define democracy? Uh, and how do you, uh, in particular, if you want to rate different countries in different ways? So um, we did not come up with our own new definition of democracy. We relied on ones that have already been uh, presented by other scholars. And we, we have in the book, uh, for, because we have this region-by-region region analysis, we actually... Uh, chart the, uh, the changes in numbers of democracies in each region. And in order to do that, we had to come up with a sort of numerical way of identifying democracies and non-democracies. And so we followed the approach of some other scholars who use a combination of Freedom House scoring system. And there's a scoring system that is uh, referred to as the Polity Four project, which identifies regime types, and so, and we selected a, a threshold that's been um, put forward by some other scholars in the literature. So we didn't we didn't come up with our own new definition. But uh, that said, we also have a caveat in the book that you know it's to some extent artificial to try to come up with precise definitions of when exactly a country becomes a democracy or not, or when exactly is democracy consolidated, and so. Our narrative discussion is much more textured than that and doesn't rely on this particular scoring system. Do you want to talk about the first question about Sure. I, I can take a, a, the first shot at one and three, and maybe you can jump in. Um, so in terms of the first question about um, the skepticism regarding the idea that you would offer concessions to the military to ease them out of power, uh, as we mentioned, it's certainly not an ideal scenario, but it might be uh, you know, required. Uh, the idea is to provide them enough reassurances that there'll be, if not a parachute, you know, some uh, enough of a soft landing to get them out of, of the political game. And you might make concessions on non-political activities. So to put some meat on the bones, for example, in Egypt's modern history since the 1952 Free Officers Revolution, they've never had a civilian minister of defense. That might be a step too far this year, next year. You might be able to make a concession on that while falling on your sword over an issue like unilaterally issuing constitutional supplementals. You might allow some them to continue having tax advantages, which they do have on their agricultural production, but not their manufacturing production and so forth. You might be able to offer enough carrots to ease them out of power. That's the idea. It's less than ideal. I agree with you. It could be a slippery slope towards cohabitation as you describe it, but it's how the process has been navigated at times elsewhere. In terms of the uh, third question about uh, the role of uh, gender equality or women's rights in constitutions, you know, I find some of the developments on that front in the Arab world particularly troubling. If we look at Egypt, for example, 
There's a lot of disagreement over revising the electoral law. What there was not disagreement over was getting rid of the female quotas, which were seen as a, as a way to bolster the NDP. So everyone was willing to give up on the female quotas, which is great. You know, the rhetoric was they're half of society and we shouldn't reduce them to a quota, which would be great if it worked out that way. But look at the representation of women in parliament. Also, in terms of your specific question about constitution making, you see quotas, for example, in Egypt, the, the quota everyone has in their mind is the number of secular or secular leaning members of the 100 member constitution drafting committee versus Islamists. In Egypt, it's regional, right? 20 from each of the three major regions. But when you focus on those particular quotas, you often ignore things like female representation. And I think in many ways, uh, females have been, female rights have been left out of the Arab Spring. I have a slightly different view on the military issue, and I, I appreciate what our colleague from Freedom House has said in that <clears throat> something has to break the hold of a military on power. And in some cases, it's a crisis of legitimacy of the military due to its own failings, like in Argentina with the Falklands War, where the failure in the Falklands kind of snapped the Argentine public's view of the military. Or... There's a deeper idea in the society of a loss of legitimacy of the military's rule due to the fact, like in Latin America, the idea was we are civilian, supposed to be civilian-led democracies. Militaries came into power in the late 60s, early 70s, because we faced crises of leftist insurgency or possible leftist insurgency. You solved those, so why are you still in power? By the early 1980s, people were asking the Brazilian, Argentine, Chilean, Uruguayan militaries, and others, what are you still here? You're not, it's not your role in this society. Egypt's got a different problem. <clears throat> the military is among the most legitimate institutions in society, and it has worked its way into power over the last half century or more in a way that's fundamentally different than Latin America. And so the power of the Egyptian military has not been broken, despite the beheading of the regime. And I don't think just <clears throat> the kind of negotiations that you describe are necessarily going to constitute such a process of breaking. I think we're, it's still to come. It may not happen, or it may happen through increased confrontation or renewed confrontation, or something else might occur. <clears throat> um, but I actually think what you're describing comes after the break. And that break hasn't occurred yet in Egypt. Uh, Marina, yeah, I'd like to this. add uh, something here, which is really more generally in relation to all the questions and also to some of the discussion that took place before. When we were discussing the lessons that uh, the book stresses, I kept on thinking lessons for whom? Because these are lessons for us analysts outside the country. We have the leisure to sit down and look at what the lessons are. I'm sure that uh, the Malta Brotherhood is not going to read those lessons and couldn't care less if they did. And neither is the military. The, the way in which uh, these issues are decided is in real life, uh, you know, struggle for power in the countries. The issue of whether the, uh, uh, there, are the, uh, there are going to be concessions made to the military, it's going to be decided by the, whether or not the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the only other actor at this point, feels it has enough power to get uh, some, uh, to, how much power it has to get which concession from the military. This is what's going to decide the issue. It's not whether they are desirable or not. I would say, yes, it would be very desirable to get the military totally out of, uh, of the political process in Egypt. Is it going to happen? No way it's going to happen. And then we'll have to see how it is going to uh, how it's going to, uh, uh, you know, to work out on the ground in the relationship between two groups, and we still don't know. And there are, uh, and it's not just a relationship between the military and the uh, and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. It's also the relationship between the military and the courts in the Muslim Brotherhood, because a lot of these fights are now fought through the court. It's a bit the same concerning the question about the Constitution. It's not a question of what should be in the Constitution or what the Constitution should say on certain issues. The question is, who is, has the power to influence what goes in the Constitution at this point? And I totally agree that on that point, probably these are, the prospects are rather bleak because none of the important actors in Egypt has much interest on that, uh, in that particular issue. So we really have to understand that this process, I mean, it's, 
I'm not saying that it's useless to look at the lessons of other countries, but what is going to decide these cases, uh, you know, in each specific instance, it's really, the, it's really the politics of the situation, the political game that's being played, the power game that's being played. And now I stop talking and let me take more questions. Yes. Um, there's a microphone right there. Um, uh, you spoke about the uh, Islamic uh, um, inclusion. Um, would you care to talk also about the possibility of Islamic dominance and exclusion by Islamists and deterioration into extremism like we've seen in many other examples, Hamas, Taliban, Algeria, and so forth. But isn't that also something that should go into the equation? Thank you. We have another question right here and one way back at the, the woman standing. With. Thank you. Um, Johan Bukuraj from the uh, Oxbridge Learning Academy. Um, I was glad to hear about the um, analogies with Eastern Europe, I come from Eastern Europe myself, from a country that has experienced tra transition, and I'm glad that uh, you find those analogies misplaced, because in Eastern Europe, even though every single transition was unique, it had the same aim, namely democratization as we know it today, whereas in the Arab world, uh, we don't know what the clear aims are. We just learned that the liberals won the elections in Libya and the Muslim Brotherhood in, in, in Egypt. So what I'm thinking of is uh, three major actors in the proximity of the Arab world, namely Turkey, Israel, and the European Union. Do you think that these three actors uh, will play a key role in democrati democratization as we understand it in the Western world, or whether the Arab world will, will go in that direction of democratization as we understand it? Thank you. Hi, Michaela from the Aspen Institute. What is your opinion of Tunisia's de democratic transition, and do you think Tunisia could serve as a model for other countries in the Arab world? Thank you. Okay. Um, on the, the second question about what influence these other external actors that you mentioned might have on democratization, I think uh, experience shows that the dominant forces and dynamics propelling democratization, whether it succeeds or doesn't succeed, are the internal ones. Uh, and that the, the influence of external actors tends to be fairly marginal, um, whether you're talking about their, their influence diplomatically or in terms of foreign assistance. So we didn't see any, I mean, we didn't focus on the specific question that you asked, but we did look at the question of what impact the external environment has. And I mean, certainly in some circumstances and most obviously in Central and Eastern Europe, um, external uh, factors played a played a huge role in the opening of the transition process. Obviously, the you know, demise of the Soviet Union was, a, was what led to the transition openings in those cases, but that's different than, uh, than looking at what happens afterwards. I mean, probably the most influential outside, um, uh, most influential sort of experience or example of outside actors playing an important role is in Europe with the European integration process, which had a very important um, norm-setting role and assistance uh, they provided. And obviously, the attraction of European integration was a huge incentive. But um, that, we think, is not a replicable experience elsewhere in the world at the, at the current time. Um, I did, uh, you may want to say a word about uh, the, the first uh, and third questions, but I did just want to say a couple of words about the, the, this issue of, of what is the value of lessons and why do we, why do we look at lessons. And I think we're, we're very careful in the study, and I think this is a very important point, to not say that because an experience is unfolded in a particular way in a particular country or group of countries, therefore that will happen in Egypt and Tunisia. And this is something we thought about a lot in devising the initial design of the study. We thought, well, you know, do we want to try to identify countries that in some way seem analogous to, say, Egypt and Tunisia? Uh, and ultimately decided that really wasn't feasible. For, you know, on what analogous, on what dimensions? Um, there's just such a multiplicity of 
of dimensions involved in a democratization process. And you know, ultimately, if you try to directly analogize between one country and another in this sort of area on these topics, you, know, you can always poke holes in it. So this is why we try to instead be very broad ranging and looking at a variety of experiences and to, um, and to draw lessons and to not um, try to make some sort of calculation of, well, you know, this has happened in 60% of the cases, therefore that's what's going to happen. Right. Sure. But instead, in our conclusions, we're much more selective about suggesting the ways that those lessons apply and may not apply. But, but even so, I mean, I don't think, um, you know, lessons can be used um, always in the way that policymakers would prefer, which is tell me what's going to happen. Tell me exactly what I can do. You know, what's the policy decision that we can take today? I think they're helpful in giving us a framework for trying to understand what is happening, for looking at in what ways our experiences in different places, both similar and different. Uh, and you know, by looking at what was important in other countries, it gives us some clues or insights into what may be important in the Arab world, but certainly doesn't determine that events will unfold in a particular way. Jeff, did you want to? Yeah, uh, quickly in terms of questions one and three, I really appreciate your question. I think it's important for those of us who have, uh, you know, leaned towards being convinced by some of the uh, moderation that the Muslim Brotherhood has shows or change, changes in their positions, I think in a positive way, it's important to acknowledge that there's plenty of other people that see double speak that see um, uh, aspirations to dominate the political system. And I think those fears are legitimate. Um, I don't happen to share them. I think if the analogy you might be building from is Iran, I, I don't see it as particularly portable to this situation and that there lacks a clerical class. Uh, you know, some of the differences between Shia and Sunni Islam in terms of deference to clerical authority are missing. And the Brotherhood has come a long way. I don't want to sound like an apologist for the Brotherhood but you know, it's an organization started in 1928. If you look at the trajectory, this is based on my personal interviews with Muslim Brotherhood leadership and youth. Um, you know, they've gone from not embracing multi-party politics to participating in electoral coalitions. They've changed the way they talk about cops and society. I mentioned during the introduction, I'm still troubled by their positions on minority rights, but we shouldn't ignore the, the very real steps they've taken. Um, but I agree with you that a reasonable person, where I see a trend in the positive, a reasonable person can come to a different conclusion. Uh, the double speak, the hidden agenda. And then finally, in terms of Tunisia, I'm glad you raised this issue. It's actually, I think, I think I can speak for both of us in saying it's probably the Arab Spring country that we're most optimistic about. And I think it gets back to some of the structural factors that uh, Tom focused on in discussing the book, which is, you know, the absence of natural resources that, you know, can create a basis for the Rentier state. Uh, and Nehida and it's the Islamist party there and its particular orientation, um, having a largely secular middle class, a smaller state that's largely removed from geopolitics in the sense that, you're right, uh, Western powers have to own up to the fact that there's cer certainly been a stability reform trade-off with regards to Egypt, we've prioritized things like access over democratization. Tunisia is farther removed from that simply because they're not as geostrategically important. So it has a number of advantages. I have a feeling that Marina might talk about sequencing. It's sequenced its transition differently and that also might be beneficial. Although we argue in the book there is no boilerplate. There's no best practices for sequencing. It's a, you know, it's a matter of particular circumstances. But one could argue that in Egypt there was probably too much focus on elections over constitution making, and in some ways that's been dealt differently uh, in Tunisia. A couple of things. <clears throat> First, I want to emphasize or sort of uh, underline what Marina said about lessons for whom. Over the last 18 months, the Egyptian society as well as political elite has been subjected to more lessons learned than in any transition I've ever seen. Um, people rushed to Cairo over the last year and a half and organized seminars and workshops and conferences on the Polish transition, the Chilean transition, the Philippine transition, the you know French Revolution, one thing and another. Um, and I'm not sure how much that's all added up to. I mean, I think it probably has helped diffuse some ideas among some people in Egypt. But it was epitomized or brought to a sharp point in 
February, March, April last year when some people in the US government led by the White House worked day and night for a while on a big binder on lessons of transitions from around the world. They didn't have the benefit of the study. They had to do it quickly uh, <clears throat> with, with the poor working conditions of people in the government without the kind of research assistance that they always need. But they prepared this fairly sophisticated binder on transition lessons and they had a senior US official deliver it by hand directly to Tantawi, the head of the scout. <laughs> And when that official came back from the region, you know, I think people said to him, so did you give him the binder? You know, does he have the binder? <laughs> well, he has the binder. Now, where he has stored it, um, <laughs> has he read it regularly, <clears throat> ever? You know, it doesn't seem to have weighed heavily on his thinking about, a per, you know, the Egyptian military's role in this transition, but he has the knowledge. Um, so lessons, you know, for whom? Second point I would make about <clears throat> international influence, I, I would add a footnote, and I think it's mentioned in your book usefully, is the European Union, it's true that most of the, you know, most transitions are made from within and outside actors are a secondary or sometimes often marginal force, but in the case of the European Union in Central and Eastern Europe, as we know, the fact of European the entry to the European Union as a target for Central and Eastern Europe did have a significant effect on setting agendas in those countries. And the European Union role in Tunisia is significant. The European Union has taken a number of steps, both in trade and other economic uh, policy issues with Tunisia that have been helpful and that have helped Tunisia see a future as not a member of the European Union, but as having a, a fairly good and productive relationship with Europe, both economically and politically. The European Union doesn't really extend that framework down to Egypt or to other countries because that doesn't, doesn't view it as its natural reach. But I think we will see, if we look back over time on the Tunisian transition, a positive impact of the European Union role. Third point I mentioned about <clears throat> the question about will Tunisia be a model for the rest of the Arab world? I mean, something I puzzled over the years is, you know, when, when do countries serve as models for their regions? You know, I used to, you know, in 1970s and 80s, Latin America was not very democratic. And there was Costa Rica, a shining democracy, really like a great democracy in Latin America. Civil place with terrific values and high levels of civic participation. You know, it was a little island of democracy for a long time. And when those countries democratized, I don't recall any Latin American ever saying to me in Brazil or Argentina or Paraguay or elsewhere, it was Costa Rica that showed us the way. <laughs> Same is true with um, Botswana in Southern Africa. Botswana has had a fairly decent political system for a long time, but it's rare that you would hear a South African or a Nigerian or a Mozambican or a Kenyan say, we're looking to Botswana as our example. Uh, I don't mean to ridicule those countries, I'm just saying that it just isn't somehow the reference points, or Moldova is actually doing pretty well on democracy. It's the only part of the former Soviet Union is doing pretty well, but I don't think Russians are looking to Moldova and saying, we'll follow the Moldovans. <laughs> um, it's just sort of not how Russians think about life. Uh, and so we have to be careful of saying, if only Tunisia becomes democratic, then Saudi Arabia will just say, wow, now we see how it's done. Um, we'll just follow the Tunisians. Is that somehow isn't, hasn't been the pattern in other regions? And so I think it's great that Tunisia is doing well. I think it will be a good thing for the region. But in terms of small countries being beacons that shape the thinking of larger countries in their regions, we have to be cautious in our assessment of that process. If I could just add something really quick, which is since Tom and Marina have been kind enough to eviscerate the basis for, you, for, for <laughs> deriving lessons, uh, and, and we thank them for that. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, one reason to do it is for whom is to condition the expectations of the international community of people within the U.S. government, and we're thinking about that. So not just, you know, dictating to people in the region you should do X, Y, and Z, but really conditioning people to what might be the outcomes here, how long of a process will it be. And I do actually think that people in the region are drawing lessons. I did interviews with the People 6 group. They talk about Serbian youth. Don't think the Egyptian military isn't looking at the Turkish military, both for warnings, for civilians resting back control, and for advancing their institutional interests through constitutions. They're clearly taking lessons learned. I just, I just wanted to add one thing to what Tom said about this uh, question of, of being a model. One of the points that we look at in the study is this question of democratic diffusion or democratic contagion that some have pointed to. Uh, and where we come out on that is that um, on the whole, that kind of uh, you know contagion 
can be um, an actual phenomenon in terms of sparking transformations, and we've certainly seen you know the sort of inspiration moving from Tunisia to Egypt to elsewhere, but that we don't see any effect in terms of the actual consolidation of democracy over time. I mean, that said, there are some statistical studies that show that on average, having democratic neighbors. Um, tends to be associated with increases in, uh, in democratization in a region, but it's not so, uh, you know, find a point that you can say, well, one democratic neighbor is enough or two democratic neighbors is enough, and there are obviously exceptions. I mean, Mongolia doesn't have any, you know, doesn't have democratic neighbors, and yet it democratized. Okay, I just want to add one point quickly. The implement, it's not that lessons are irrelevant or people don't look at other cases. They look at cases very selectively, first of all. There are, everybody in Egypt talks about the Turkish model and everybody has a different idea of what the Turkish model is because, you know, it's Turkish model of 1997, which is what the SCAF seems to be doing now and it's tried to, uh, it's quite possible that they outlawed the Freedom and Justice Party the way, the way in which the Turks uh, outlawed Erbakan's party in the past. You know, so there are very, very different models. But I think the issue of the lessons is important. Only when lessons are important, only when are lessons on an issue over which you have control. In other words, to say it's better you raise the issue of sequency, it's better, it, you know, it's better to have the constitution before election rather than the election before constitution, whichever. It's only important if you have any, uh, any control over the timing of the writing of the constitution or the elections, otherwise it's irrelevant. The issue that you're, you're concerned about the Islamists, that there are good reasons to be concerned about the Islamists. We have absolutely no control of whether Islamists are going to be important players or not. So that the only choice that we have is how do we relate to them? So that in a sense, the, the issue of, you know, whether it's desirable or not to have them in the process, it's not terribly important because we cannot prevent them from being part of the process at this point. Uh, let me reopen it. I'll have, uh, there are people uh, outside the room here because there was not a room for everybody. So I'll ask one question. One, unfortunately, I cannot read. It's, uh, <laughs> the other one writes, big, and the, the question that I read is uh, concern what is, whether there is a role for the United Nations mm -hmm. in promoting democracy in the, uh, for, uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring. There is one question there, and there was another question well, I, I have lost the other, and I'll take you. <laughs> yes. Roger Betancourt, University of Maryland. Uh, the report has been very interesting. And Can I you speak in the, you are difficult to hear. The report has been very interesting and very measured in describing democratization in all its dimensions. Uh, but there is a certain asymmetry. The emphasis on the positive has meant that there has there have been no lessons drawn about de-democratization, which hasn't even been mentioned explicitly and certainly seems to have happened in the world. Some of the examples, uh, like the Russia has been given. Argentina is a case in which people can argue whether it has been going back, backwards or not. Did you consider that issue? Okay, there is. What? It was the same question, then I'll take you. <laughs> this guy. Hello, uh, Matthew Williams from the Oxbridge Learning Academy. I was wondering if you thought social media was a relevant factor in the regime changes in the Arab world and potentially an unprecedented factor in democratization studies. And does it play a part potentially in the consolidation, if, it, if at all, of these new regimes? Thank you. Um, just quickly on each of these, in terms of a UN role, um, I mean, we haven't seen the UN playing a very significant role at this stage. I mean, there are certain UN agencies that can provide some technical assistance for some of the more technical aspects related to elections and constitution making and such. 
uh, which can sometimes be helpful, and sometimes they coordinate providing the kinds of assistance that uh, Tom referenced in terms of the you know flood of consultants and advisors that have gone to Cairo. Uh, but I mean, on the whole, these sorts of processes are not really technical ones. I mean, they are political processes, and um, there, um, I, I wouldn't say I see a large role for the UN in terms of democratization in the region. Um, in terms of lessons of de-democratization, yes, we, we do look at this to some extent, um, though it hasn't come up in the discussion today. Uh, you know, we did not look at countries that didn't have a, a democratic uh, or a transition experience at all, because our point was to look at uh, countries that have had a transition opening and then what has happened in terms of the democratization process. So we're not comparing countries that have remained authoritarian to those that have uh, had some democratic, um, uh, have been building up their democracies. But we did look at cases uh, where there has been some regression. And, and one of the things that we've identified, particularly in the sub-Saharan African cases, is the lack of institutional development. I mean, it is, it is the case that democracy can, uh, can uh, you know, can be built in pretty much any circumstances, but in places that are poor and have weak institutions and weak um, weak governance, uh, democracy tends to be more vulnerable. And you know, Mali, unfortunately, is one example of that. During the course of most of our study, it was one of our success cases, and then at the last moment, we had to do a little rewriting and uh, show how this um, highlights the way in which poor, uh, weakly institutionalized states remain vulnerable. Um, I, on social media, I, yeah. think I'm, I'm, I tend to be a little skeptical about the role, but that may just be because I'm older than Jess. So <laughs> I'm a Luddite, so I'm also skeptical. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we treat it a bit in the study, and we think it's uh, context dependent in the sense that you know it depends, of course, on the penetration rates within the particular country. For example, think about Syria, even though actually the ban on uh, Facebook was lifted by Bashar al-Assad and the regime as a way to, you know, actually track dissidents. Um, it, penetration is so low there, it would be hard to argue that something like Facebook is a phenomenon driving this. If you want to join the revolution, what do you do? You go to a mosque outside of Friday prayer. It, it's fairly obvious how to join the revolution in Syria. Um, in, in Egypt, uh, uh, it, it probably was significant. We look at you know groups like April 6, which not only put out the initial call for January 25th online, but they're largely online communities themselves. So it would be hard to argue that uh, the January 25th revolution, so to speak, would have happened without social media. On the other hand, would it have happened January 27th or January 28th? By other means, perhaps it's a counterfactual uh, that you can't really solve. But uh, you know, again, I think the main takeaway is very context dependent. In a place like Syria, low penetration. In a place like Egypt, low penetration, but important among certain demographics like uh, urban youth. This doesn't relate to social media per se, but there is one uh, one study that's done a very extensive statistical analysis of factors that are um, associated with democratization or not, which found that media proliferation, sort of the proliferation of media outlets in a country, is one of the factors that is most robustly associated with successful democratization. A role, uh, just a word on the UN role. Uh, you know, don't forget the UN played an important role with the Arab Human Development Report in sponsoring that in the early years of the 2000s. That had a lot of important psychological effect on the region. But <clears throat> the UN generally, particularly UNDP as a development organization in the region, did work for many years in close collaboration with the authoritarian governments of the region. And when the changes started occurring in Tunisia and Egypt and elsewhere, UNDP found itself in a difficult role with respect to its credibility with Arab citizens because they saw that UNDP had long been a partner of these governments. And UNDP had to scramble or to, to take some significant efforts to start to try to reposition itself. So that's that's been an issue. You know, the UN is by its nature as an organization put in the role of working collaboratively with governments in place. And so in situations of transition like this actually it puts the UN in a, a difficult position. So I think the UN has serious intentions to play a positive role. 
but they're still in the midst of reestablishing credibility. I was at a meeting in Cairo with some people from UNDP and elsewhere, and they were talking about models of political dialogue, which they had used in Latin America fairly effectively to get people together across party lines to build political consensus. And they said we could, given UNDP's particular role as a neutral actor, we could play a similar role in the Arab world. And some of the Arab participants in the meeting said that's true, but in Latin America, you didn't have the problem of credibility that you have here in the Arab world, and it's serious here. And you will not today be accepted just as a neutral actor in any kind of dialogue, dialogue between old forces of order and new forces. So that's a fact for the UN, but I think there are serious people within UNDP who are trying to, are aware of that and are trying to change it. This issue that uh, Tom uh, stresses about uh, the past, it's a big problem for any external actor to uh, play an important role now. I think it's difficult to, un uh, to overestimate uh, the fact that, that all foreign organizations, all foreign embassies uh, there are faced with the problem of having rebuilt uh, their Rolodex. I mean, they don't know the new actors. They are barely beginning to establish relations with the, uh, with the new actors. So that we are not in, no, but none of the outsiders is in a terribly good position to, uh, uh, to, to have an impact, whether it is the inter, uh, you know, international organization, bilateral actors, and so on. Everybody is in the same boat on this one. I think we have... Three. We'll take one last question. Uh, we cannot take three more, but I'll, if there is somebody who has one burning last question, you get the honor. <laughs> okay. And we'll keep the answer quick so that we can finish on time. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Wade. I'm an intern at National Defense University. And given the fact that we've talked a lot about how external actors have little um, influence on democratization, what implications or suggestions does that have for American foreign policy towards the region? What did you say? What implications for U.S. foreign policy? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, as Jeff mentioned, you know, one of the, the points that we'd like to make is that it's important to have realistic expectations about what's ahead, and that's why I started with uh, the lesson that taking the long view is important and being patient is important, and that's very difficult for U.S. policymakers and for U.S. foreign policy, but. Uh, but in this case, uh, really is the most realistic way to, to consider these challenges. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the point that Marina just made is, is a, a very relevant one here. Uh, the U.S. is just going to have a lot less leverage in terms of transitions in the Arab world than it did in some past transitions, uh, uh, you know, including the European transitions, Latin American transitions, and elsewhere, even in places where it might have had some credibility issues. But, you know, here it's, um, it's problematic to set the bar higher for these new regimes than you did for the old regimes. And so the ability of the U.S. to exert the kind of uh, you know, moral and diplomatic pressure that it might be able to in other circumstances, even leaving aside any kind of practical assistance, is, is going to be a real challenge. So remaining realistic, uh, being modest in, in both our expectations and what we attempt to do, I think, is called for. And maybe focusing efforts on states where we do have more influence, even though the overall trend is declining influence. There's actually some cases where the U.S. isn't powerless, I would say. Um, the Congressional Research Service uh, puts the annual uh, foreign military financing, the FMF grant to Egypt, as financing 80 percent of their acquisitions. It gives you some leverage. They're looking for, you know, three plus billion dollar bailout from the IMF, of which uh, the Western community has some, some say. Bahrain, the Fifth Fleet, is stationed there. You know, there's particularly on the mill-to-mill -mill side, the uh, the military-to-military -military side, the influence is an absent. Just as a closing comment, I would say that I think uh, you're right, Laurel, that Marina and I have raised the question of lessons for whom, but I, I take your book in the spirit of that you are addressing Western policy community, and it has been a community which has really been in a kind of bipolar mood about these transitions mm -hmm. and could use some calming down. And so mm -hmm. I think this book is very valuable in 
getting people, as you say, to emphasize the long term, to realize that it's a very, it's been very unpredictable, very up and down in a number of other countries and so forth. So I, I take the spirit of that, and I think it is, it is valuable. Maureen and I have been emphasizing how it's often the ones one wishes maybe read the lessons, thought them through that are caught up in their own situations and really act on the basis of their real position rather than that. But this exercise, I think, will contribute to, especially in a presidential campaign year, when people tend to try to make a lot out of success or failure abroad, that there is or isn't the responsibility of the United States, exercises like this do help provide a, a better basis for a, a more realistic view. Okay. Well, we are at the end of our time. Thank you all for coming, and please help me thank the speakers. <laughs>